23 and 59 was the record of the 2021 2022 Detroit Pistons. Pistons fans, welcome to the channel here at Utility Sports. Today's video is focused completely and solely on your favorite team, the Detroit Pistons, and an offseason preview for this team because I think there is a lot of high upside going forward with this team. There's a lot of different ways that this team can improve. We're going to talk about all of that and more in today's video. So if you guys are excited for today's video and also the Detroit Pistons offseason, make sure to leave a like and also subscribe to the channel. And I do have a quick note here for Pistons fans, just because I feel like you guys do deserve a, a shout out here. You've been dealing with a lot of rough sports as of late. Uh, you know, the Lions, Pistons, Red Wings. It's been a tough go. But I do want to commend you guys because I do think out of all the viewers that watch my channel here, Pistons fans are probably the most energetic, the most caring, and the most enthusiastic about their teams. They really, you guys really do put a chip on your shoulder when it comes to your fandom. So I do want to commend you guys on that awesome fan base and hopefully you guys do enjoy today's video. Let's go ahead and jump into the video preview here. We're going to talk about what we're going to you know, record on here in this video conclusion of the 2021-2022 season, the record, bright spots, key decisions to make going forward, NBA draft picks, which assets they have, and NBA draft targets they could look at, key players heading toward free agency that they could lose, NBA free agency itself, cap space situation, potential targets, and also my prediction for next season and maybe some hopes for next season as well. Pistons fans, again, hopefully you are excited for this video. Let's go ahead and now move forward into the 2021-2022 season that just concluded. Remember, the Pistons finished with a record of 23-59. and 59. So no, not a very good record. But remember, when you had the first overall pick last year in Cade Cunningham, you know, you have the first overall pick for a reason. This team wasn't going to be great this year. Everyone knew that going in. But I do think we did see some bright spots that were really, really awesome. And you see all the asterisks around Cade Cunningham's name. That's because everything starts and ends with him, if we're being honest. Cade Cunningham is the future of Detroit basketball. He was awesome this season. And I know Pistons fans, maybe the first week of the season, you were a little nervous because he was having a, a few bad games in comparison to Evan Mobley. Scotty Barnes really starting the season strong. But Cade Cunningham, for a majority of the season, played phenomenal basketball. He was, I think, arguably the best rookie in the class uh, this season with his play. Now, I had him number one on my draft board last year. And I think he has vindicated that and shown that he's worthy of that selection first overall. And if, if we were to redo the draft right now, I think every team in the league would still take Kate Cunningham first, just based off what we've seen. Multiple 25, five and five games. And that's really what you're getting here, Detroit. You've got a, a plus size playmaker who can create off the bounce for himself, create for others, puts pressure on the rim. And I think he's a, a really fun player to watch. He's very Luka Doncic-esque. Uh, even if he never gets to Luca's level, I mean, he's going to be a great, great player. And I think that Pistons fans should be extremely excited that Cade Cunningham will be on the roster for the foreseeable future. Another player I think that you should be excited about here is Marvin Bagley III. After trading for him from Sacramento, he's actually had some really nice performances for the Detroit Pistons and maybe has resurrected his career a little bit. And I think he's a very natural fit next to Cade, specifically with the capability to be an athletic role man and also to work off the baseline uh, his skill set does complement Kate Cunningham's fairly well so I think that the Marvin Bagley deal I said it on uh, at the trade deadline that they basically gave up nothing to get him uh, and I think they're in a really good spot that they brought him in simply because you know you get to try out a guy who was a former number two overall pick not very often you get to bring in a player who at one point was considered a potential star down the road so I think Marvin Bagley probably will never reach star potential but I think that he could be a nice forward for this team and, and play a little bit of the big man spot as well. And then I want to talk about the ancillary pieces here around those two guys. Sadiq Bey had some really great performances this year, and I think he's one of the more safe players going forward. If you want to look at a player who's going to be productive and help a team win, Sadiq Bey is perfect for that because he's going to play good defense. He's going to shoot the three ball well, and he also has shown some signs of growing as a creator, a slasher, getting to the rim. Uh, I thought he was a really good pickup when they took him, and they did a really great job with that. Then I also want to commend Isaiah Stewart. Uh, he's a force on the offensive glass. He's tough to box out. He plays physical. He plays hard every night. I think one of the highlights of the Pistons this year was probably the beef between Isaiah Stewart and also LeBron James. You know, just the fact that you have a player who can get under arguably the greatest of all time skin like that, uh, it is an awesome 
thing to have on your team. That competitive nature is really important when you're trying to build a, an identity and a team chemistry uh, and really a culture there in Detroit basketball. So I think that uh, Beef Stew is a very, very good player to have on this roster. Then I want to talk about the Jeremy Grant question. And Jeremy Grant, I think, is a very interesting player to talk about because his situation is very unique. Not very often you have a team that's been closer to the bottom, make a big splash signing on a guy like Jeremy Grant, who you know maybe hasn't proved it as much before coming into Detroit, but now has been given the opportunity to have the keys to the offense and has put up 20 points per game since signing with Detroit. So I think he's an interesting player. He's going into the last year of his contract. He is contract extension eligible. So now GM Troy Weaver has a decision to make. And those two decisions are right here. You have to look at the fit. Do you feel that Jeremy Grant can be a long-term fit next to Cade Cunningham, next to Killian Hayes, next to Sadiq Bey, next to Isaiah Stewart, next to Marvin Bagley? Or do you trade him for draft assets? Or And also you would get probably a, a sizable trade exception in this as well. You see he makes about $21 million this next season. If they trade him in a deal to a team that has cap space and they don't take any money back, they would have a $21 million cap uh, cap space trade exception that they could use for up to 18 months. So say you roll into next season, you see some more internal progression, you go into next off season, and then you'd have $21 million that you could just outright bring in using draft picks without having to match salary. That could also be very beneficial for this Pistons team. So I don't want to just look at it as just purely draft assets as the only thing you're getting, because if you do trade him to say Portland, you could get, you know, maybe a top 10 pick and then also get a lot of flexibility in terms of cap maneuvering with that trade exception. So there's definitely some real legitimacy to Troy Weaver, I think, considering trading him. But at the same time, he's been very reluctant to do so up to this point. I want to know, Pistons fans, do you want Jeremy Grant traded or not? I think very possible he could get traded with Portland. They have two picks inside the lottery, assuming that the New Orleans Pelicans don't win in the plane and get into the playoffs. Now, if they do, that does complicate what Portland has. But ultimately here, Jeremy Grant, uh, I think either way is not a bad option. If I was in the GM shoes, I'd probably really explore trading him and see what I could get. Um, and I would even maybe push for Patrick Williams as hard as I can. Uh, but I don't know if that's likely Patrick Williams for the Chicago Bulls, a very, very good player. So I'm not sure if the Bulls would like to do that. Uh, but if you look at the fit versus value and timeline, you know, you could try and maximize Jeremy Grant's value after two really good seasons, career years for him. And then you could say, maybe we're trying to align our timeline a little bit more. But at the same time, I'm not totally against having a 28 year old while the rest of your good young players are like 21, 22, simply because you do need some veteran leadership and also and also you know, it's not like just all of a sudden since you have 22 year olds that your team's going to be really good because they're all in the same timeline. That's not really how basketball works. Uh, but if you have really special 22 year olds, that's kind of how it works. So it would depend on the packages you're getting. But again, Pistons fans, I want to know what your thoughts are. My biggest thought is that if he does get traded, it will be to Portland. Moving on to some other decisions that the, Bla uh, that the Pistons have to make. Hamadou Diallo has a $5.2 million team option. For me, that is one that I would strongly considering, strongly consider declining. Their $5.2 million for Hamadou Diallo is quite a bit of money. And we're going to talk about why I would say that. Frank Jackson at $3.15 million on a team option. I would decline that as well. And then Luca Garza at 1.56. I would actually pick up that team option simply because it's at the price basically of a minimum. So you're not going to get another player at the minimum that you're like, in love with anyway so you might as well keep the younger Luca Garza then go out and get you know a veteran mid-level uh or not a vet veteran mid-level but a veteran minimum type player so for me Luca Garza makes sense Jackson and Diallo though do not make sense for me even though Pistons fans maybe disagree um we'll talk about more why I chose those players uh and why I would decline those ones NBA draft picks they have their own first round pick this year which of course is going to be highly important and then they also have the Nets second round pick this season. So they have two draft picks in this year's draft. We do have mock drafts up on the channel. So check that out after this video. And with their own first round pick, here's some draft targets I laid out. But first, I want to talk about the ping pong balls. I had a video come out on how the NBA draft lottery works and the odds that the Detroit Pistons have in the NBA draft lottery. If you are interested in that, I will try and put a card for that right here. Make sure to check that video out as well. Now for draft targets, here they are, and I want your guys' opinion 
on this. Now it is it's going to really rely on where they fall in the draft. It's very possible they could pick as low as seven, but it's also possible uh, that they could pick uh, as high as one. So I don't exactly know where they're selecting, but I do have a wide range of players here that I think they would consider in those ranges. If they're around pick one to three, the top two guys are probably the ones they would target the most. Jaden Ivey out of Purdue and Jabari Smith out of Auburn. Now I know there's a real split in the fan base right now about who they would rather have. For me, I have Jaden Ivey as the number one player in this year's draft class. I think he's going to be the most transcendent player. But also, if I'm Detroit, I would strongly consider Jabari Smith as well because I know Pistons fans, the need you guys feel for having a little bit more size and length. And then if you also want to look at something the Pistons need to get better at, they rank 29th out of 30 in the NBA in three-point percentage offensively. So they need a little bit more shooting, and Jabari Smith is a very talented shooter. He's going to come into the NBA and shoot the ball very, very well. So I think Jaden Ivey, Jabari Smith are the obvious top two candidates here for Detroit. Pistons fans probably would want them the most, I would have to guess as well, just based on everything I've read and saw. So Pistons fans, what I want you to do is I want you to comment right now, who would you rather have? Jaden Ivey, the guard out of Purdue, or Jabari Smith, the forward out of Auburn? Now let's assume they're picking for Devil's Advocate's sake, they're picking, and Jaden Ivey and Jabari Smith are both off the board. Chet Holmgren can make some sense. I think uh, Isaiah Stewart's actually a perfect complement to Chet because he brings the physicality and strength that Chet doesn't necessarily have right now. Uh, and I think those two could be a, a really interesting pairing, actually, with Chet's skill set and Isaiah Stewart's hustle, energy, effort, strength. I think that that would be a really good pairing. Paulo Boncaro. Uh, it's, to me, it seems like Pistons fans don't want Paulo as much as maybe other fan bases. And I understand why, but again, he's a pretty strong player. He rebounds the ball well. In Detroit, in addition to also not shooting the three ball well, they also did not rebound the basketball well. Finished in the bottom five in the NBA in rebounding this past season per game. So I think that a guy like Paulo, who can play the power forward spot at about six foot ten, he's got an NBA ready body. I do think the Pistons would consider him, especially if Ivy and Jabari are both off the board. Then let's say worst case scenario happens, they fall to like five, six, or seven. I think they would really strongly consider Benedict Matherin or Johnny Davis, the guard out of Wisconsin. Matherin, maybe not the most clear cut fit uh, and same with Johnny Davis, but at, this, at the point here, it's about going with talent and trying to get more talent on this roster. I think the Pistons are talent deficient uh, in certain areas, especially when it comes to depth. You know, I think the Pistons have four or five good players uh, and realistically, teams that make the playoffs have about seven, eight, or maybe even nine good players in certain cases. So I think that the Pistons just need to find good players. Benedict Matherin, Johnny Davis, in a worst case scenario that the Pistons fall to like six or seven, Benedict Matherin or Johnny Davis, maybe even A.J. Griffin could be available at that point. And I think they would strongly consider one of those players. A.J. Griffin would help with the three-point shooting as well. And then with the second round selection, players I think that they could target include Johnny Juzang out of UCLA, now, I know Isaiah Livers was a really good find for them out of Michigan. Uh, I, I really like that draft pick when they took him, actually, a physical wing who can play on both ends of the floor. But I think Johnny Juzang gives you a little bit more scoring bench punch, which I think this team could use. Ron Harper Jr., if he's available in the second round, I would love that. He, I have a scouting profile video of him up. Very, very intriguing player for me, specifically because of what he can do defensively, and I think it would really help Detroit limiting uh, offensive team scoring outputs against them. Isaiah Mobley is a big who can shoot the three ball. So again, this would help with the rebounding and three point shooting in the second round. I think it's pretty good value for him. He is the brother of Evan Mobley, Julian Strother from Gonzaga. I think he might go in the end of the first round, but if he is there in round two, he could be an interesting wing pickup. Fairly similar to Livers, uh, but I think maybe a little bit better in terms of playing off the ball, a little bit more skilled as well than where Livers is currently. And then Bryce McGowan's is a high upside type selection here. He's a six foot seven shooting guard from Nebraska very athletic kid and he's not afraid to take any shot uh, he'll shoot anything on the move loves to live in that mid-range area has good bounce getting to the rim the thing about him is trying to put it all together he's a little wiry right now and he's a little inconsistent he'll probably need a little bit of time with the Grand Rapids drive trying to improve his his technique his footwork and his skill set but I think Bryce McGowan's long term I actually compare him a little bit to Chris Middleton their their size length uh, and skill sets fairly similar when Middleton came out. Now, McGowan's going to need a lot of development to get to Chris Middleton level, but I think that there is some long-term potential there if Detroit wanted to tap into that. Pistons fans, now we're going to move to NBA free agency, and the Pistons projected to have at least $27.436 million in cap space 
And this is partially why I decided I would not want to keep Hamadou Diallo or I would not want to keep Frank Jackson. And this is because it gives you a little bit more cap space flexibility heading into an off season where not a lot of teams have cap space. And I know it's not the strongest free agent class, but there are some decent players out here. And there's a few different directions you could go here if you're Detroit. You could go big for one player, uh, which we'll talk about potential options there. And you could use your mid-level exception to sign a role player as well. Or you could split that money into two or three role players and still use your mid-level exception, which is non-taxpayer around $10 million to sign an additional role player. So this is what I'm talking about here when I say most teams have, you know, seven to eight or nine good players and the Pistons have around five right now that I would say are consistently good. And if you're looking for that improvement up to seven or eight, this is how you could do it. You could go big for one guy and then use a mid-level to get another solid player. And then you're up to about seven. Otherwise, if you split that money into two or three and then use your mid-level, you can maybe be up to nine really solid good players, which would really help this roster, really improve your depth. And then you use a draft pick and you get way better. Uh, so the Pistons, they do have a little bit of flexibility here with what they want to look at. And we're going to start with the role player type pieces. So these are guys they could consider for the mid-level exception or using cap space. Let's start off with Mitchell Robinson here. I know Pistons fans, you've been clamoring for size. You want a big who can protect the rim and rebound the basketball. Mitchell Robinson, he's an unrestricted free agent from the New York Knicks, and he does really, really well in both those areas that you're looking for. Now, offensively, doesn't really shoot the three ball uh, and probably going to be a, a pretty good fit next to Cade Cunningham, uh, but maybe not a good fit next to Isaiah Stewart or next to Marvin Bagley. So for me with Mitchell Robinson here, he's probably going to get around $14 million, I would guess, per year on the open market, which is a pretty good contract point for him. Uh, and I think the Pistons, if you want to use half your cap space on a guy, Mitchell Robinson would make some sense. Nick Claxton's a cheaper option than Mitchell Robinson. However, the difficulty here is he is restricted. So the Nets do have matching rights on him. Uh, so say you wanted to sign him to a four-year $28 million deal or a three years 24, something like that, where he's getting seven to $8 million a year. I could see that being his price point. Biggest issue with him is he just doesn't have the stamina, doesn't play a ton of minutes right now for Brooklyn, even though I do think he's a pretty solid uh, center who can switch out into space fairly well. He's a really good defensive-minded center, which would help Detroit. Uh, but the issue we hear is I think Brooklyn would try and keep him. Gary Harris, Torian Prince, TJ Warren, Jeremy Lamb, Victor Oladipo are the others I've named up to this point. For me, Gary Harris, I don't know if I love that. I, he probably gets like $13 million a year on the open market. Uh, based on how he played this past year with Orlando, maybe a little bit less. He, I could maybe see him go for the mid-level around that $10 million a year mark. Uh, that would be an interesting grab for Detroit, just shoring up that shooting guard position. I know Killian Hayes, there's a lot of split belief as well around him with Pistons fans. So if you feel like you want to upgrade a shooting guard, Gary Harris could be an option. Torian Prince could be a depth forward. Sometimes he's out of Minnesota Timberwolves rotation. Sometimes he's a big part of it. So he's had a little bit of an inconsistent season as well. Uh, but I do think he gives you a little bit more versatility. TJ Warren could be a big swing guy on a one-year deal. Uh, and maybe you could even put a team option on that, like at the two years, $20 million, uh, $20 million total mark. So $10 million annually. Uh, and it could make some sense before his injury. Uh, he was playing really great basketball. Now that injury has kept him out for almost two seasons. Uh, it's a foot injury as well. So it's not something that's super easy to recover from. So there's a little bit of risk here. But again, the risk would be the first year. And if you have a team option on it, you could get right off of that contract after year one if it just doesn't pan out. Jeremy Lamb, Victor Oladipo, those are examples of guards here again that could help you maybe long term uh, and give you a little bit of juice into that offensive lineup uh, when you're looking at if you want to bring both these guys off the bench, I think they'd be willing to play into that role. You could start them, bring Killian Hayes off the bench. It would really depend on what Detroit wants to do here with this, uh, and it depends on who they want to draft. But I think there are some good options here that do make some sense for Detroit in terms of role players. And now let's go into the big time additions that could make some sense, starting with Jalen Brunson. Pistons fans, you know there's going to be some interest from your camp into Jalen Brunson, and he's an unrestricted free agent from the Dallas Mavericks. Now, for me, I think he's going to end up in that four-year, $80 million total mark, so $20 million a year for him, which is quite hefty, but he has really immensely improved. Uh, Jalen Brunson is one of the better free agents available this offseason, and partially why I think Detroit would have interest in him 
is he has taken massive steps forward being a starter this season, uh, has had some really, really great games when Luka Doncic didn't play and also around Luka Doncic. So if you're looking for a player who fits next to Cade Cunningham, why not go get someone who is fit next to Luka Doncic? And that's when Jalen Brunson can play without the ball, but very crafty, talented when he does have the ball as well. Zach Levine, that likely won't happen. Uh, this is like a pipe dream here, is that somehow Levine actually does test free agency. You throw a max contract at him, no trade clause, player option, uh, and you tell him, hey, you're going to be the face of the team right next to Cade Cunningham. Uh, we have something growing here. Now, I don't think this will actually happen. Uh, but, you know, if they even get a meeting with Zach Levine, that's a win because it shows that free agents are taking this team seriously. DeAndre Ayton, a restricted free agent from the Phoenix Suns. This is an option here where you maybe have to pay him nearly a max to get him because I think Phoenix is at an interesting spot. Ayton's so essential to this team. And if you're Detroit looking for a big man, if you can sign DeAndre Ayton and then draft Jaden Ivey, your team gets way better. But the thing with DeAndre Ayton is I don't think he's worth a max. Uh, which is going to cr sound crazy to say, but look at how JaVale McGee, Bismack Biombo have performed over there in Phoenix. Now, clearly they're not the Aiton's level, but I really think the play of Chris Paul has immensely improved what DeAndre Aiton has been in the league. And I think Kate Cunningham could help Aiton as well, but simultaneously, I don't know if he's worth a max contract. For me with Aiton here, I think Phoenix is going to be really up against the luxury tax here soon with the Mikhail Bridges extension. You've also got Chris Paul extended, Devin Booker's extended. You are also going to have to look at Cam Johnson getting extended at some point. The Suns are going to run out of money here at some point, and they have an owner who historically hasn't paid. So if you want to go out and give a really good offer sheet to DeAndre Aiden, you could put pressure on the Suns and try and steal him away, similar to what the Brooklyn Nets used to do with uh, contract offers to guys like Joe Harris, who ended up signing with them, actually didn't get matched there. Or you could look at Tyler Johnson, who they offered him like a four-year, $64 million contract. The Miami Heat actually matched and it put the Heat in a really tough spot there because they were overpaying Tyler Johnson simply because they felt pressure to match. Here, the Pistons have a little bit of leverage where they could give Aiton a really big contract offer. And then maybe the Suns feel pressured to match. And then they do. And then they actually are in a really tough spot financially because of what the Pistons did to them. They put them in a little bit of a hold. So uh, I think that Troy Weaver has some options here. And then Colin Sexton as well, uh, restricted free agent from Cleveland. Again, I don't think this one's very likely, uh, but if they don't want to go in on Jalen Brunson, they could maybe go get Colin Sexton instead. He's a little bit younger, maybe fits the timeline a little better, but ultimately I think these are the best options for them. All of these guys are younger than 27 years old. So there's a really good collection of players that could make some long-term sense here for Detroit. And if you do keep Jeremy Grant, I mean, you could have a pretty good lineup going. Let's say they get Jalen Brunson. You go into next season with Kate Cunningham, Jalen Brunson, mm -hmm. Sadiq Bey, Jeremy Grant, and then insert a center. And you could even maybe have Jabari Smith in there with that. Like that, that's a really good cast of players. So for me, Detroit has a lot of flexibility. We'll see exactly what they end up doing this offseason, though. But these are the players I think are most likely. Next season, the hope is to be near or maybe even in the play in tournament. And I know that sounds a little bit crazy right now because they just finished 23 and 59. But part of why I'm projecting that the hope is to be near it or maybe even in it is because Cade Cunningham is ready to take a massive step forward. We saw it with Luka Doncic in year two, went from averaging 21.2 points a game upwards of 28. And I think Cade Cunningham is going to make a similar jump Maybe not quite to that 28 point per game extreme, but maybe up to 25 points a night. And if he does that and his assists go up as well, we're talking about a megastar. And Detroit, I think they're needy of a superstar. And Kate Cunningham is going to be that guy. I said it on uh, around the draft last year. Kate Cunningham was always my number one guy in the class. And Detroit really luckily landed on him uh, with the first overall pick. You know, they, that was awesome. It was huge for that franchise. Uh, and then the question here around him is, can Killian Hayes maybe fulfill expectations of being a, a former number seven overall pick? I think the fact that, you know, Pistons took him over Tyrese Halliburton, like let's assume they still get Cade and they have Halliburton on this roster. It's a, it's a completely different feel. But, you know, Killian Hayes, he looked better as of late toward the end of the season. Now, part of that was you're playing against some G League level rosters with what the Oklahoma City Thunder were putting out there. You know, 
Like the jury's still out on Killian Hayes. He hasn't even played 90 career games. So for Killian Hayes, you know, we need to see a little bit more from him. I was never high on him, to be honest with you guys. Uh, but they're going to need to find some consistency, not only from Killian, but from the whole team. I think they need to develop an identity. And we'll see. Let me know how many wins you think the Pistons could have next year. I'm hopeful that it can be into the mid-30s. So we'll see. Maybe Detroit can get there. Maybe not. It is a really tough Eastern Conference. So we'll see exactly where Detroit ends up. But again, thank you guys so much for watching. Pistons fans, you are so awesome. You deserve a lot of credit for how much passion you bring to the YouTube comment section here about your Detroit Pistons. For more Pistons content, leave a like on today's video and also subscribe to the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. Again, go check out our mock drafts. Go check out some of our scouting profiles and go check out that NBA draft lottery video as well with how I explain it. Hopefully you guys enjoy and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.